Well, I must thank the previous speaker, Dr. Kumosa, for covering much of the grounds that I have to. I was worried, worrying how I'm going to get to the materials. I didn't realize uh, the time is, is so short. But nevertheless, I'll just have a stab and skip many of the areas that he has already covered. Um, well, brain drain, he has defined brain drain uh, that I simply say large scale immigration with technical skills and knowledge. Yeah. Many other definitions of, of, of brain drain, and you could see some of those. He has already classified these ones in organizational, geographical, and industrial. He has already touched on some of those. I don't need to go through that. But we do know that Nigeria as an economy is suffering from brain drain without a doubt. But he also raises the question uh, is it brain drain or brain gain, and what is the link between the two, and how was the balance between the two? Um, and, and we'll see how we get, how far we can go on those. But we do know that there are many issues that, apart from crippling the economy, and we know that some of the reasons are, are infrastructure deficit. Our stock of infrastructure in Nigeria is only about five percent of our GDP, compared to South Africa, that's eighty percent. And we have so many issues, borders, border security issues, human rights. Many things are pushing people out of the country. Um, some of those, you look at some countries that have highest brain drain. Let's look at just Iran. In 2006, IMF ranked them as the highest among 90 countries, and with over 180,000 people living each year in poor job market and oppressive social conditions. But in South America, for a different reason, Guyana is, you know, more than 70% of their of their manpower are vanishing uh, with tertiary education across the United States and the rest of the regions. But then in the case of Nigeria, uh, the previous speaker has mentioned that the middle class is highly is hit. And if you look at many successful economies in the world, especially the Asian tiger economies, the growth of the middle class mirrors the, the growth in their economy. What you, uh, and in Nigeria, we have that missing middle that you have less than 5% at the top and then the rest of them are there at the bottom. So the middle class is actually what the time is when the country is ready to move. Now, the, the brain drain started seriously in 1970, immediately after the second, after the war, after the, sorry, the Afro war, because when we came out of war, there were a few universities and they brought, they brought this uh, a quota system and many of our boys couldn't find university. They all started to come out to America. Um, and that's because they don't have qualification A level to go to UK. So everybody was heading out to UK, uh, America. And they were all saying that they are football captains, football captains, so that it is scholarships. So a lot of them moved there. But later in the 80s, we have a different uh, variety. Um, uh, and many issues that happened around that 80s, especially when we had the crunch, uh, that the music started changing at that, that, that time. Now, how do you, how do you handle brain break? Uh, how, do you, how do you curve the menace? Uh, various things, you know, you can say investment. Investment is very important because if you don't have investment and you don't have investment in technology, you cannot just say government employ people. You cannot say people come out of university and employ yourself. Investment is important to create an investment of technology to create that economic activity, which creates the employment. And then when that affects factor productivity and pushes it up, the people are likely to stay because when you increase factor productivity, you generate more return, and then you can pay people decent salary, and they have disposable income from getting a decent salary. From there, they can pay for education, health, and poverty reduction. And that is the starting cycle. If you think you can jump one or two, you're on your own. But, but that is that is that's the correct cycle. Now, looking at some challenges, you can see some uh, so some some graph which shows the impact on, 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 economy, you know, on economic development. Look at the world, and then you see the high income, the middle income countries, low income countries, you can see the impact, the less educated and the college graduates in, uh, in, across the world, you can see that it's not as impactful as it is in the low income countries. There's a wider disparity. You look at, uh, now the share of migrants from poor countries to high income countries, just look at that graph. If you look at OECD to non-OECD countries, compare it to non-OECD countries, to non-OECD countries, which is the second one. And then the third one 
which is OECD to OECD. For example, you saw in all the integration of European Union, there was more mobility across Europe, so you could expect very high. But then for non-OECD to OECD, it dropped. And then now look at the trend over years, over the years, and then see the spread between them, that it gets wider. As you go to the year 2000, the gap widens a, 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 a lot more. Now you look at the immigration rates in high income countries, I think you probably pointed out that, the, the tra trajectory. It seems, it just, this is just, um, it, it just, uh, just to indicate that, yes, there is increase, rapid increase in world trade, the real trade and world GDP, they're all heading up in the, in the right direction. But suddenly it looks as if the stock of immigrants are also uh, going up. But that is not a causal relation to what they say, just, just, just to give you an, a, a flavor of what is going on, but it is not by any means a causal relationship. Then you see the, uh, there are other factors beyond the first one that I mentioned, other factors that enter into the equation of brain drain, you know, high unemployment, there are others, and I don't need to, to go to, you have all this slide anyway for you to go to, let me keep to my time. Then, then there are questions about what are the pull, pull factor and push factor and for a country. You can see how they played out. Uh, where the pulling factors for brain drain uh, was showing high income, much, much higher and living condition being the, the push factor, pulling factor, and then better jobs and work, working conditions, and then family future and security of less importance than those personal freedom. So political stability, you could see in that sex how that, but then when you look at the push factor on the same country, you could see that the poor education Social economic situation and desire to go abroad where 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 are more of the push factors. So there are there are two two sides of that coin. Now well, let's focus on Nigeria uh, to some extent now and see whether we have whether we are acting very differently or whether we are in sync. Uh, issues the same as I showed you before. Issues the same. You know uh, the, the impact and consequences reduction in the quality of service. Yes reduction in standard of education, that is also affecting, you know, because most of the people who would have been teaching in schools have walked away. So that is also part of the reason that is affecting our education. And then, of course, there are several ways it affects economic growth uh, from the manpower perspective. We still have serious mismatch in our labor profile because we, what we are churning out of the university system don't even have any relevance to the skill profile required by the industry. So, uh, but, but we needed to have our people in, in the right place to, to help. The, some aspect of this I will, I will deal with later on. Now, also, there's also creation of job opportunity with adequate remuneration, which are some of the solutions that are being uh, thrown around. I'm not sure you can just talk about this without talking about investment, because investment is what has to come in. It's not government that will provide that job opportunity. They don't have it. They will distort the market. So. Which the emphasis should be more on, 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 on investment, in flow of investment, and then technology that are relevant. And I'm glad my speaker, previous speaker talked about digital technology. In, I'm the chairman, national chair of the digital economy, bioeconomy, science, technology, and innovation in our medium term national development plan for 2021 2025, and also agenda 2050. So I try to bring these three technologies together and make sure that people understand that the new economy for Nigeria is going to be built on, on, on this platform. And, and things have changed. There's no time to talk about that, but things are changing from, from what we are doing on the national planning framework. The quality educational opportunities, yes, should be provided. You have to of local incentives and all those called more conducive environment. That's, if the government provides conducive environment, then some of our people who have the capacity will engage and who have the resources and the funding of tertiary education is not just funding alone. There are more issues about tertiary education uh, than, than funding. And there are much more accountability in governance. People are just funding the money and we just can't find them to invest. Economic impact, that this is where we need to spend a bit more time. Um, question says, uh, does the migration of highly educated people from developing countries hurt local economies? I have been talking about this. Does it decimate their human capital and fiscal revenues? Uh, I think uh, my colleague agrees with me on that. Yes. Now, or how does a highly educated diaspora start to develop economies through the military, foreign direct investment, and that is the brain gain 
side of the argument. So we're going to look at both. One says that is is a, is a bad, bad, bad. The other one says, well, what did in fact, Obasanjo in the first term of his office came to London. Uh, I don't remember what it was, 2000 or something. And then he said, I want all of you back. All of you are asking, you know, where's Job? What are we coming back? He said, oh, he told me about I said, no, 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 don't come. Just send your money. Send your money. <laughs> so there are two sides to that story. Right, let's, let's look at some figures. Um, PC, PWC uh, looked at something, though it is dated, Robert, but they were estimating. And these are all just rough estimates. Right? There were about 1.2 million uh, migrants from Nigeria and the diaspora. And they'll just, you will know that the figure much, much higher. It's more around 2 million then, then um, likely to be higher in 2028 and 19. And he was looking at the remittance flow um, of 22 billion in 2017 that rose. To, it actually, in 2000, I think it was around, it rose to 26 billion and they started coming down uh, with, the, with the COVID-19. Um, then it says that these remittances translated into 2% of federal government budget. I think there was a time when it now exceeded the Nigerian government budget. Uh, we'll find it later down in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the graphs. Then it says it's 11 times the foreign direct investment flow into the same period. I think it's even more than much, much more than that. You need to see the figure. I don't even know if I brought those. If you see the figure of, of our foreign direct investment is just a bit. They're just in a few hundreds of millions uh, altogether over a year. The portfolio investment used to pop up, but it's, it's gone. It's appeared March last year uh, because of the COVID. It's never been one that you could build your economy on anybody because one body language could make them disappear overnight. So I, I, don't, I don't count on those. Then there are some projections that they had there in you know, 2019, 25 billion, 2029, and 30, 30, 2034 for 2023. Um, I think we'll probably be, we will exceed that the 2023 target, the way things are, are going right now. Now, but look at this estimation. I remember that in 2005, I think, World Bank estimated that uh, each, uh, each African diaspora contributes about 184,000. Uh, dollars to the economy per year to the economy of the West. So for an estimated 1.5 to 2 million Nigerian professionals, it would really amount to about $275 billion to $368 billion a year to the economy of the West. Now, if you try to link this to the remittance we know that is coming in, which is around 24 to 26 billion now, that means that it's approximately 10%. Approximately 10% of our, of our economic value to the West is coming back to us as remittance. And there are critical questions that we have to ask ourselves is, you know, around the flow of that investment. How is it entering into our economic equation? How could we maximize that? What is the role of technology in this? How are they helping us with, uh, you know, bilateral trade? And, you know, there are many things that we could do. But as far as I know, it's just a number. And uh, how are we getting people to answer the question that I ask them? The, then coming down home, I know the, the legal, the medical guy is going to talk about this. Um, the World Health recommended a ratio of one doctor to 600 patients. Nigeria has a ratio of one to 5,000 patients. UK has a doctor patient ratio of one to 300. And, uh, and yet you have more medical doctors migrating. Uh, people consider that Nigeria may have spent about $2 billion training in medical doctors uh, only for them to uh, take a dive. And uh, I haven't heard that in, uh, in LA that there are more doctors there than, than, than the doctors we have in Nigeria. But also, there are also, I think I would say LA and New York, because both, both centers are, that, that are huge, huge numbers of our people in there. Uh, right, some human flight index. Um, showing that things are, are getting a, a little bit better. If you look at the human flight index and brain drain index, zero for low and 10 for high over the period of 2007 to 2021. Just compare that. The world average is about for 174.3 countries. The world average is 5.2, but Nigeria is currently at 6.5. So we're much, much higher. But then look at the Nigerian trajectory. You could see that over time from 2014, we're gradually coming down, uh, but still high at 6.5, uh, estimated at 2021. Now, the other area is the 
growing supply of young people in Nigeria and the growing employer demand in Europe. Yeah, those are facts we know. You know, I don't need to dwell on this. Those are the facts we know uh, based on the evidence the previous speaker has provided and what I have said uh, before. But you can see the graph, he has already shown you this graph. I don't need to go into that. I have some reservations on this. Then, um, then the Africa total, you can see the, the behavior for non-humanitarian first residents permit and then asylum seekers. And then see how the, in the case of sub-Saharan Africa, how the figure is, the, 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 is, is shooting up. The asylum seeker is being used as a major conduit for African, well, sub-Saharan Africa going, going out. Then let's look at, now let's look at these figures, so unemployment rates. Now look at Nigerian unemployment rate when you're looking at some of the causes of immigration, unemployment rates and underemployment rates. You can see that our unemployment rates as at, uh, is, is just over, is about 33%. That is for the average. If you look at the ones for the young people, the young people is over, still over 50%. And then, of course, when you bring in on the underemployment, the story, the story gets, uh, it gets out of us. Yeah, then, you know, more, more graphs on uh, property index. I don't want to go into the inflation because it's not going to, we don't we won't have the time to go through that. Labor force participation rates, those you can see the graphically, you can appreciate that, or graphically, you can see the dip, uh, the dip in, uh, in 2014. Uh, and then, is now getting worse, it's, it's steaming ahead because our population growth rates are going up significantly. Now, the international migration patterns across the world, you can see the figures, Africa is about 25.4 million moving in out, but as they are going out, they're also coming in. So that, that, that doesn't represent the totality of who we have out of the country. There's some other estimates from, um, from the UN that the number of international migrants worldwide increase uh, in the last 20 years, so, you know, uh, we've seen that about 281 million. That number continues to increase anyway. Then, um, as a percentage for Nigeria, as a percentage of our total population in Nigeria is affected, is you can see that the pattern is is is, uh, is off. Then, if you look at net migration stock, you can see the behavior of the of the graph. You can look at look at other 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 sides of that story. Um, the has remittances, I've mentioned that, uh, the figures I have shown you before, but these are more hard figures. It could, be, it could get better, but COVID has taken it down a little bit. In fact, to the point that the CBN government intervened forcefully. Because what happened was, I, I kept asking that question, what's happening with our remittance? If we have been six billion and the government is getting less, why don't we just get stiff on this so that we can have a lot of things available? But the banks we are often deals with IMT, International Money Transfer Organizations, and then the people were being stitched up and then CBN intervened forcefully and said, no, send all that money to them in their commissary account. Let them have the choice of who they want to go and buy the dollar. Say buy or sell their dollar. Then they refused, boom, they blocked their accounts, closed all their Nigerian accounts, and things got very rough from there. But at least uh, it's now on the hot, on the hot policy table. Uh, many things need to come on that hot policy table as well, actually. Get us there on remittance, you know, because We've we'll, we'll talked more about remittance. We don't want to talk anymore. We, we all know what the score is. Just bring more money to Nigeria, please. You, know, you guys should bring more money to Nigeria and let's use it to do useful things. We've seen the top receivers of it in Nigeria. Nigeria is the biggest in Africa. I think there's even one where we got two thirds of the total remittance coming to Africa. So it's, uh, it's gone from one third to two third, more than half now. Figures are, are getting that. You can see the graphs. Uh, that the figures. Uh, we, we are very, very strong when it comes to, you can see how it undermines oil revenue. Now see this graph on the right, which compares oil revenue uh, uh, and migration remittance, and uh, migrant remittance. You can see that it, we are, it's superior. It's, uh, it's, it's now superior to, to government oil revenue. But in terms of policy, you don't see it being um, uh, taken uh, seriously into account. But, but that's why I'm here, I'm fighting that. All right, thank you very much, it's such a pleasure to be with you.